We are a conservative think tank, and, but I will tell you that if we believe in making government less intrusive and personal responsibility and accountability, we have to shine the light in the darkest of places and the most restrictive areas of government control, which is a solitary confinement. So I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, one of the issues that we feel strongly about is ending the practice of releasing inmates directly from solitary confinement. This is a major problem in Texas with over 1,300 re such releases directly from solitary confinement in 2011 from Texas state prisons. Um, in Washington State, a study was done on their Supermax unit that found inmates released directly from solitary confinement were 35 percent more likely to commit a new offense, uh, and even more likely than that to commit a new violent offense, as compared to comparable inmates with similar risk and offense profiles who were not released directly from solitary confinement. Um, I also want to point out the successes that we've seen in states around the country. Uh, Mississippi, as noted earlier, uh, has gone down from 1,300 inmates in 2007 in solitary confinement to today only 300. And that has saved them over $6 million because it's less than half the cost. But I think most importantly, violence in Mississippi prisons has dropped 70 percent since they made those reductions. And in Maine, for example, they've gone from 139 in solitary confinement at their Warren unit to between 35 and 45 today, just in the last couple of years. And what I want to note is their corrections commissioner, Joseph Ponte, has noted the downsizing of solitary confinement has led to substantial reductions in violence reductions in use of force, reductions in use of restraint chairs, reductions in inmates cutting themselves up, which used to happen every week. He said it's been almost totally eliminated as a result of these changes. Part of what they've done there is reducing the duration of solitary confinement. For example, those that used to go there for drugs, they may still go, but if they uh, test clean for drugs, they can graduate out of solitary confinement. And if someone's being kept there for more than 72 hours, that decision is reviewed by the commissioner. Um, I also want to note that uh, one of the keys in Texas to reducing our solitary confinement has been the gang renunciation and disassociation program. Inmates can earn their way out of solitary confinement by exemplary behavior and renouncing their gang membership. I also want to point out that using sanctions and incentives behind bars is a way to provide uh, for uh, incentives that lead inmates to behave better, which therefore reduces the need for solitary confinement. Uh, one of the models is the parallel universe model used in Arizona through their Getting Ready program. And so what, for example, inmates who with exemplary behavior may have a longer curfew. Those that misbehave have uh, may be denied certain privileges, such as uh, making phone calls and, for example, uh, also access to the mail and other other things except for their attorneys. And so this creates a positive incentive. By the same token, we know through things like the Hawaii Hope Program, SWIFT and certain sanctions work. And so there is a role for a 24-hour timeout, for example. But again, we have to make sure that we're not overusing solitary confinement for long periods. One of the perhaps the strongest incentives is, of course, earned time. Uh, and I will tell you we're very pleased that Senator Cornyn, uh, Senator Whitehouse, and other members are supporting earned time legislation, particularly for nonviolent offenders in the federal system. Clearly, by reducing the number of dead enders, we can uh, make sure folks have an incentive for good behavior in prison. And also, by the way, a study has shown 36 percent uh, fewer new offenses for those released to parole as opposed to discharged without supervision. Uh, I want to go over uh, a list of recommendations that we would, we would urge you to do in addition to, of course, ending the release directly from solitary confinement. Uh, those include uh, eliminating rules that deny any reading materials to those in solitary confinement, improving training and de-escalation techniques for prison personnel, training in mental retardation and mental illness, uh, also uh, using that parallel universe model that creates incentives for positive behavior and self-improvement, uh, creating a matrix of intermediate sanctions. Now, this wouldn't be for those who do serious bodily injury or staff member to another inmate who, of course, should go to solitary for an extensive period, but for those that commit minor violations uh, behind bars, that they would have an intermediate sanctions that uh, can be used to get their attention and correct the behavior before it leads to solitary. Uh, reducing the number of dead enders through the earned time policy, the missioned housing, which was mentioned earlier for those who, for example, have, are, recent, are in protective custody, former police officers, those who are mentally ill, those who are in the process of leaving a gang. Unfortunately, those individuals often end up in the same 23-hour-a-day cell as those who are being punished for disciplinary violations, when we know these smaller housing communities with a better staff-inmate ratio can address that issue. And I will tell you that if we can address the overcrowding, that helps immensely, because when you have inmates piled in day rooms with inadequate staff ratio, that makes it more difficult to diffuse the very tensions that often lead to placement in solitary confinement. So I want to thank the committee for their work on this, and I truly believe we're on the path to solutions that will both increase our order in prisons and make the public safer when these inmates are discharged. Thanks, Mr. Levin. 
Uh, again, thanks to the entire